Hi, everyone. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the founder and editor of Orinoco Tribune based in Caracas, Venezuela, orinocotribune.com. Uh, we today have the pleasure of having with us uh, uh, Jyoti Brar from the UK. From the, from, uh, she is, uh, let, uh, she is uh, a British anti-imperialist and a scientific socialist leader of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist. She's the daughter of Harper Brar and the sister of Ranjit Brar. Uh, Jyoti has been involved in a socialist movement since she was a teenager. She has worked as a trade union organizer and has written extensively on imperialism, socialism, and the working class. And I believe that she is the promoter of something that is called World's Anti-Imperialist Platform that we are going to talk about just right now. So welcome, Jyoti. And and let me jump to the first question uh, right now. I mean, I wanted to ask you, or, or that we have a conversation in this first part about Europe's approach towards imperialism and what that means in relation to that initiative that you are leading of the world's anti-imperialist platform. Uh, and I ask you this as a first question because... Um, for us, at least uh, uh, here in Venezuela, for me, for the people in Orinoco Tribune, it's always uh, concerning the, to hear a lot of so-called Marxists in Europe, and especially in the UK, talking about uh, imperialism and putting together the US, Russia, and China in the same taco, as we say it in Venezuela, in the same place. So tell me a little bit about that. You know, it's a really good question. There's not one approach, unfortunately, to imperialism in uh, Europe or in the world. And you put your finger on it, really. There's a there's a there's a divide as to how imperialism is understood, how Marxism is interpreted, essentially, because how you define imperialism is actually a question of Marxism. It was defined. Uh, historically by Vladimir Lenin, who oh. was the founder of Marxism-Leninism, right? Marxism for the era of imperialism. That's what mm. makes the difference between Leninism and Marxism was Lenin's scientific evaluation of this new stage of capitalist development, which is imperialism. So this is a scientific socialist question that requires serious study. Imperialism is not a word of abuse. And very often it's used that way. Uh, interestingly, this has been really done by the imperialists themselves. They've taken our terminology and turned it against us. And it's become a popular term of abuse that the imperialists use against their enemies. And they've taken other uh, terms from our lexicon also. They talk about self-determination. The, the recognition of a nation's right to self-determination was also something that was worked out by the Bolsheviks, yes. by Lenin. And colonization. The they, they do the same with yes, colonization. Exactly. So they, they use these terms, which are Leninist, which are Marxist terms, which, which have, have an emotional impact on socialists, right? Uh, and, they, and they use them to describe their actions. So they say, they talk about Russia as an aggressive imperialist power, so that immediately has a, an, an emotional impact on people who identify as socialists, right? Oh, gosh, I can't be on the side of aggressive imperialists. Um, and then they say what they want to do, bless them, is to decolonize Russia. That's how they talk about their yes. plan to, to attack, to break up, to destroy Russia. They describe it as decolonizing. They're on a liberating mission, don't you understand? <laughs> so the imperialists are very good at taking our terminology and using it against us. But of course, this only works if you're a self-identifying emotional communist and not an actual student of socialism. Because if you study Marxism, this won't fool you. Right? You have to look not just at words, but the content of the words, the policy that drives the words that are being expressed and what what's really going on now the imperialism imperialists are masters of deception and of presentation but still if you are prepared to look and to study you can see the facts and the real activity that's going on underneath so with that little bit of context um this split in the socialist movement is not a new thing in fact 
my favorite reading material at this moment in time is the volumes of Lenin's writings from World War I. Because at that time, they dealt with exactly the same problem in the socialist movement. You know, before World War I broke out, socialists everywhere said the war that's coming, and they all agreed that a war was coming, a big war between the imperialists, they agreed it would be an inter-imperialist war. But when the war actually broke out, many of them went back on what they had said. They had made a commitment that they would not encourage the workers to fight in such a war, which was about who should get to divide and loot the world. They would encourage the workers to turn their guns on the ruling classes of the imperialist countries to make a civil war for, uh, for socialism, to turn that war into revolutionary war at home. That was their commitment before the war. Then the war broke out and the leaders of most of the European, what were supposed to be socialist parties at that time, defected from that position and sided with the imperialists. So this question of a split in the socialist movement is not a new question, it's an old question. Because of that split at that time, uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks, who were the ones who stuck to the socialist position and had a successful revolution as a result, they were then the founders of a new communist movement. They refounded the Socialist International on the basis of uh, Bolshevism, and that was the basis of the world communist movement. But now we've had we've a history, you know, a hundred year history and all kinds of things that have happened since then. We now find again that that movement is very divided and there is not one unified approach to the struggle or to the understanding of imperialism. And again, the root cause is opportunism. It's the way that the pressure, whether it's financial, economic, political, you know, whether it's push coercion or whether it's bribery, you know, the, the imperialists have all kinds of ways of affecting our movement. And they've created a section within our movement which treats imperialism in a way which is helpful to imperialism. So we have people calling themselves communist and social, socialist, some of them leading quite big, influential, strong parties who are saying to workers in their countries and not only in their countries, but around the world, heavily pushing a line that tells the working class around the world, you don't have a side in this war. Russia is an aggressive imperialist power that's invaded Ukraine. They've taken the whole question of the context of the war and just disappeared it. You know, the fact that the, the imperialists have been, we're, tr we're trying to use Ukraine against Russia um, ever since the Soviet Union was founded, right? And even, even before, in fact, in the days of Imperial Russia, they wanted to do it. But certainly through the whole history of the USSR, there were imperialists trying to manipulate nationalist feelings in the West of Ukraine in order to break up the Soviet Union. It was, it was a, a, a persistent, consistent aim. And that continued after the fall of the Soviet Union. And the idea that Russia just one day, you know, Vladimir Putin one day woke up and decided he was going to attack Ukraine because he's an evil, aggressive monopolist and, you know, wants to loot the country. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit with anything that Russia did before last year. It doesn't fit with anything Russia has said. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense as a narrative if you know anything about the situation, whereas the 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 imperialist uh, plan to use Ukraine to beat Russia uh, as a battering ram against Russia has been ongoing for like a century, you know. So this, if you taking away all of that information and presenting a narrative the way the imperialists do that has no context is just repeating imperialist propaganda and putting some socialist phrases around it. And it's because of that split in the communist movement, because that non-Marxist line has made such a strong impression into the world communist movement. That's why we formed the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, because clarity is really needed. Workers do have a side, actually, in this war. It's not a matter of indifference to us who wins. If the imperialists win, that is going to put the whole world's people on the back foot for decades. You know, you just remember what happened when the imperialists 
got their way and the Soviet Union collapsed, when they were looting the Soviet Union, their system, which had been in a crisis, got a massive financial shot in the arm from all of that looting. And they went on the rampage, not only in Eastern Europe, but around the world. You know, we're only, you know, we've been suffering from that ever since. Do we want a repeat of that? Definitely not. Yes. Yes, we're right. Listen, Jody, uh, uh, now that I hear you talking and I, and that reminds me when I read or listen to some compass up there in Europe talking about imperialist Russia and imperialist China, I was wondering myself, what can we do? Marxist Leninist, committed Marxist Leninist, uh, to educate or to, I don't know, to avoid that deviation to happen, that deviation that the one that you are talking about, what can be done to fix that? Have you seen, have you give it a thought? Education, of course, but what else? <laughs> I mean, yes, education, one, two, and three, in, in many levels, right? As a Marxist yourself, study, study, and study again, and never stop studying. One of the things I've found is too many people who think of themselves as Marxists, they treat their Marxism like a reading list that they did once. And they're like, oh, yeah, I, I read Capital, I read Imperialism, I've read the main works of Marx, and therefore I'm a Marxist. Good, yes, you, good, good, you read those things. Therefore, I know all that stuff. I don't have to read it again. The problem is, we are inundated with bourgeois ideology all of our waking life. And if you think that some books you read, however brilliant they were, and however much you identified with them when you read them, if you think that that staying in the past as reference material is going to stand up to constant bourgeois propaganda, you are wrong. I have seen so many good Marxists take that road and they go off and do all kinds of other reading that's jolly interesting and they don't realize how their Marxism is getting weaker and how they become steadily more pragmatic about their aims under the influence of all this bourgeois propaganda. And what that's I've found point. in my life, it's so true. If you even just 10 minutes a day of reading something from the classics, from Marx, from Engels, from Lenin, it brings back not only your conviction, but your perspective. It helps you to, to, to withstand the onslaught of bourgeois propaganda, which tends to pessimism. That's it tends funny. to overwhelm. It tends to make you feel like, oh, well, we're never really going to have a revolution, are we? So I should just be commonsensical and just do the just do the next best thing. Just do something, anything that's a bit better than this is, is all right as my goal. And you forget. No, the whole point of everything I've been studying is that revolutionary situations definitely come. Socialist revolution is definitely going to happen. My job, having understood that, is to keep working for it, no matter what the situation I'm in, because definitely it's going to happen, right? But I have to work for it. And listen, now that we're talking about that, and that we know that most of this deviation of Marxism are related to factions that we call uh, uh, within the Marxist, the socialist movement, we talk about the Trotskys, the anarchists, and and different groupings within the Marxist or the socialist movement that, at least in my opinion, are part responsible for, for these deviations. How can we bring them? I mean, is, 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 do you see a possibility to bring them back to <laughs> real Marxists? Or, or do you think that this is like a, a, a pre-configured construct that that is there especially uh to sabotage the movement i think both uh and you have to look at the difference between the leaders and the inspirers of those movements and the people who get sucked into following them because of course so let's just take trotskyism as far as i'm concerned it's essentially as a modern movement it's been created and funded by the state machineries of the West, right? 
It's a petty bourgeois ideology, but it's been heavily promoted, created, funded in order to catch revolutionary young people, especially students, you know, um, who would otherwise be a reserve of the revolution, keep them busy for a while and spit them out. Now, it's been very successful because the communist movement at the, at the same time was, was, was retreating. And so there was a space for revolutionary young people where they weren't really being catered for and something comes in which plays to their prejudices but also encourages them to feel very revolutionary while not challenging actually a lot of their imperialist inspired prejudices but you know the fact is that it it's 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 catching people who sincerely want to do something about the injustice mm. they see in the world so those people are really our people. They're people who should be with us, but they've been caught by this machinery. And that's a shame for them, isn't it? But it's, yes. you've got to recognize that the ideology itself is absolutely incompatible with socialism. It's a, it's a pro-imperialist ideology, essentially, that the organizations, many of them are led and funded by the state. You know, they're, they're not going to be pulled into anything useful. But Many of their people are sincere people who just are, you know, misinformed and miseducated by this machinery. So, you know, is there is there hope for catching some of these people, changing their minds, pulling them back? Of course, if yes. there wasn't, if you can't change people's minds, you can't make a revolution. So, you know, yes. so yes. trying to trying to find ways to talk to people that are not totally antagonistic is really important when you're a revolutionary, because we are in the business of changing people's minds and changing someone's mind starts with a conversation. It starts with talking in a way where they're able to hear you. Um, and, you know, the, it's actually Trotskyist organisations which push very hard this idea of left wing politics as a fight, you know, and you, it's, you, you hate your opponent. Um, but usually the opponent they want you to hate is some other bit of the working class which has been just misinformed. Right, which holds yeah. a bunch of prejudices, which are not even in their own interests. Right, so you have to find ways to talk to workers who think that they hate you. That's true. That's true. listen. We have to jump to the next point in in, in our script. Uh, but if you want to add something that 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 you want to add, just do it. But uh, in this next second part of the of the conversation, I want to ask you about your opinion about. What happened in Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and 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 I mean, what they call uh, I mean, they call us like the the radical left in Latin America, and 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 in contraposition, they put Chile as the new left, the good one, uh, in the media. So I, I just want to hear your opinion about that thing. I mean, about this debate. Well, right now we've seen how Chile is earning its good boy points, haven't we? Uh, with the latest statements from uh, Boric about um, how Russia's an imperialist aggressor in Ukraine yes. and we all must support Ukraine. I mean, and it's fascinating to me that, you know, this is the touchstone of everything in the world right now. Uh, even in Latin America, it's becoming a touchstone. You know, where do you stand on the question of Ukraine? Who do you side with? It tells you almost everything you need to know, actually. The most important question of our times, and it's touching every corner of the globe. Um, and particularly it's touching every corner because not only because, you know, the NATO aggression is also threatening everybody in every corner of the globe. You know, NATO is trying to set up proxies in Latin America, in East Asia. There's not a corner of the globe that this North Atlantic alliance is not trying to stretch into and control. Um, but also because the US demands, you know, the US imperialists are demanding fealty from ever. They're demanding this submission before their holy crusade. You know, and everybody, everybody's got to send weapons, got got to give up kind of PR points, you know, and support this narrative that says that international community uh, supports Ukraine, etc. And international community means the people who, you know, owe favours to the USA for some reason or another. Um, and those countries which refuse to bow down are the countries which are independent. The countries which run their own foreign policy and make their own decisions and 
try to run their countries in the interests of their own people and not in the interests of the US or, or British or French banks, right? And because they do that, they are vilified. I mean, it's all you have to do to be vilified by the USA is say, I think we might um, elect a government that we choose. I think we might run our economy how we want. You don't have to be socialist <laughs> to be yeah, vilified. You know, was Syria true. socialist? You know, was Iraq socialist? Was Libya? You know, these attacks are against anyone who's independent and the vilification comes that way. What's wonderful in the world right now is to see how both Russia and China finally realized that no amount of trying to reassure the imperialists that, look, I'm not threatening you, I'm just quietly being independent over here in my corner, right, will get them to leave you alone. And because they've understood that, they've started to create the basis of a world anti-imperialist movement once again that's really coordinating. And so this is offering hope to everybody. I saw it when I was in Venezuela recently. We had an, a platform conference in Venezuela in, in March, and I've been in Venezuela before COVID, and I saw how difficult things were with the blockade there. And of course, things are still difficult. You can tell us later how you're finding things. But I could see and I could feel that despite the difficulty, there was a change in the atmosphere and there was hope in the air that says we have weathered everything they've thrown at us and we're still here. And not only are we still here, but the world is changing. And the cavalry is coming and we are going to have the ability to build our economy the way we've been promising ourselves we will. And I could, even though it's not like not quite happening yet, I could feel that sense that it's about to, everything is about to change. That's how it felt to me. And I'm sure that's happening in many countries around the world that even though they're facing difficulties, they've started to feel like there's a way out. The imperialists are not automatically gonna get their way. If you stand up for long enough, people are coming together. That all the countries which we're told by the imperialists are isolated. They try to isolate countries and then they tell us, oh, it's isolated as if it made the choice. You know, we've been hearing it about North Korea for decades. Haven't we? Oh, it's hermetic, hermetically sealed. And you're like, you're trying to seal it. Right? I don't think it's the Koreans' choice, right? But you present it. But because they stand up for themselves and say, whatever you throw at us, we are going to continue our way and we'll do everything possible to defend ourselves and our right to our system and our way of life and our choices. Um, and we won't submit to your blackmail. They're like, oh, it's, they're crazy and they're sealed off. But they do that. They do the same propaganda about Venezuela, the same propaganda about Cuba, the same propaganda about Iran, the same about China, the same, you know. And eventually it's like all these countries are like, you know, if we all get together, we actually the majority of the world. Why do we have to carry on acting as if we we can be sealed off? You know, the, the, the Americans' ability to seal everybody off, everybody off is waning. And before you, I know I'm probably talking too long, but just to underline that point, the thing that really stops the imperialist power in its tracks is when its technological monopoly is broken. And that is why it's been so important for countries like Russia, China, and the DPRK to pursue really high-tech modern weaponry because this is this advanced weaponry is what always gave the imperialists the ability to back up their economic power which they use to coerce and blackmail with this military power that says look if you don't bow to the first line of blackmail we've got the second line coming behind us and we can just wipe you out but when countries can stand up against that suddenly the US's power starts to look kind of empty. And this is what a lot of countries around the world are now taking notice of. Even in Latin America, I'm noticing, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, what are we seeing? Gosh, no wonder the Americans are feeling angry. Military cooperation with Russia, as well as trade cooperation with China, changes everything, doesn't it? Yes, yes. That's true. Uh, and I completely share your opinion, especially in that hope that many of us have, not only here in Latin America, but all over the world about the, the arrival of a new multipolar order, as 
some people call it and i believe that that's happening and we hope that you know that we move fast towards that and listen i want to jump to another question what is your position about this trend in europe uh, that is bringing fascism or extreme right movements back again i know that it, it might sound like too newsy i mean too i don't know how to say it but but like like i mean i know that fascism has been there always <laughs> especially in europe but uh right now we have seen uh like the the ray i mean that the those movements have been you know gaining momentum or something what's your opinion about that and 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 that connects to the to the political european establishment situation i mean how is that possible that in what some people see uh, as the mecca of education and knowledge and this and that that, that is europe uh, supposedly <laughs> uh these things happen the Enlightenment and all its democratic values. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question, this question of fascism, because, as you rightly say, fascism has never really gone away. Um, but I think we have to be a bit careful what we mean when we talk about fascism, because for, to my mind, there's fascism proper, and then there's the way imperialism acts around the world, and... It's not quite this, it, it looks the same, but it's slightly different. And the reason I say that is because fascism proper, as it was defined during the 1930s by the Communist International, is what happens when the imperialist ruling classes are not able to rule in a democratic way in their own country. And they have to create these militias and this regime of intense repression because the working class movement is too strong and the home situation is unstable. Exactly what we saw in Italy, in Germany, in Spain, um, in the in the period of the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so an imperialist bourgeoisie, which of course exports that type of violent repression around the world all the time. I mean, in terms of fascism for export, it's the norm, it's business as usual for imperialism to control its colonies through naked terroristic force. That has always, ask the Indians what the British Raj was like for them, you know, ask the Latin Americans what the Spanish presence was like for them or the American. You know, I, I guess that you, <laughs> we tend to call all of that fascism, and that then is a bit confusing um, because there's nothing special about a fascistic pro-imperialist regime, whether it's direct imperialist rule or by proxy in most of the world, in the oppressed world, which is the majority of the world. But there is, the whole point about imperialism is they buy social peace with money at home with bribes to the working class so that they don't have to be fighting on both fronts. They repress the people of the world with brutal, naked, terroristic force, but back at home, there's a velvet glove of bourgeois democracy, there's a few bribes, and you keep the social peace that way. And while there's a machinery of force and repression, which every state, which is a class society has, there's not that open terroristic dictatorship because the working class is not giving problems. They've been basically bought off. That's how imperialism operates, right? And Lenin set that out really, really well in his, in his book on imperialism. And, you know, all our experience has, has endorsed that. Now, in recent times, we've seen in Eastern Europe, the resuscitation of fascist ideology um, and creation of fascistic militia militias as kind of uh, NATO's bully boys on the streets of Eastern Europe, um, very strongly ever since 1991. They, they deliberately, systematically reintroduced fascist ideology and nurtured fascist militia, you know. Um, in the 
in the West, there's a kind of an, an uneasy situation where despite the fact that the bribes to the working class are drying up and the working class's position in the West is getting worse rapidly, there's still quite a long way for the workers to fall. And it hasn't yet turned into meaningful social unrest. But the ruling class is uneasy. It knows that it's likely to do so. So they're bringing in lots of repressive laws and measures and a, and a framework for suppressing the working class. Um, you can't call that fascism. It's it's like preparatory work, you know. Okay. Um, they're aware that there's a class war coming in a way that a lot of workers are not quite aware yet. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of disaffection. There's a lot of demoralization. There's a lot of uh, what I would call... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? You know, people aren't voting, but it's not because they're apathetic. It's because they're very cynical and disillusioned and they don't believe. Uh, disfranchised. Disenfranchised, yeah, they, but they, they're very cynical because they, they no longer believe journalists or politicians or anyone who's really connected with the state in a way that they did 30 years ago. There's been a huge, you know, it used to be that estate agents were the kind of most despised occupation in Britain and America and places like that. You know, these kind of sales guys will tell you anything. But now, regularly in surveys every year of the most liked, respected and despised professions, you know, you have like nurses at the top and you get politicians and journalists at the bottom. Right. So that tells you the level of cynicism. But that cynicism hasn't yet turned into organisation. There's lots of historical reasons for that. The, the, the working classes in the imperialist countries are pretty disorganized by and large. So open fascist dictatorship is not yet needed because the working class hasn't got its act together to need repressing in that way. But are they making preparations for that? Yes. And are they trying to create a right wing demagogic leadership that's ready to catch the anger of the working class as it rises? Definitely, you know, and of course, the job of communists is to is to help the workers see how they're being misled by these ideas about, you know, immigration or, you know, whatever it might be, the, the scapegoating, which is part and parcel of, you know, the, the right wing ideologies that try to keep working class anger within the system. Listen, Jordi, uh, now it's time for you to ask the questions. <laughs> Excellent. I'm happy for that. So uh, at the risk of opening a big controversy for you, uh, I would find it really helpful to hear from someone in Venezuela about the, the, the sort of open confrontation that's developed recently between the Communist Party of Venezuela and the PSUV, the ruling Venezuelan Socialist Party, because um, you know, some years ago, we were very happy when there seemed to be a memorandum of understanding, there seemed to be an agreement of joint work. You know, to, our analysis is that Venezuela is right on the front lines of the anti-imperialist struggle. And whatever difficulties there might be in working between, you know, groups which are anti-imperialist aligned, but not all, not everyone is a scientific socialist, right? Um it's very important in the context of working against imperialism to, to produce a united front and to and to make sure that the struggle against imperialism is always at the top of the agenda within that struggle. And I recently read statements, you know, I've seen this activity where the Communist Party of Venezuela is making all kinds of very lurid allegations very publicly. They're, they, they're asking the international communist movement to sign statements condemning the government of Venezuela right at the moment when imperialism is attacking the government of Venezuela. Now, to me, no matter what the content of your dispute is, this is not the behavior of an anti-imperialist. So it, I don't even know about the details of the, of the allegations that they make, but the, the way that they're making them is extremely worrying to me. So it would be really helpful to hear from you <laughs> about that. Thank you for the question. That's actually uh, uh, really a complicated situation. And and basically is a confrontation between the Venezuelan Communist Party and the PSUV. You know, the, 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 
party, the Socialist uh, United Party of Venezuela, uh, uh, and the ruling party. Uh, you know, the, 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 like, like the head of the Chavista movement. I have to tell you that I, all my life, uh, feel more connected to the Venezuelan Communist Party than to the PSUV. Mm. But that's not the situation right now, especially because of this rupture between the Communist Party and the, and the PSUV. And this rupture, in my opinion, is the result of uh, the leadership of the PCV being co-opted by Trotsky's tendencies, if you ask me. Uh, and, and, uh, and what that means in real terms, uh, it means that the Venezuelan Communist Party, we call it here PCV, uh, uh, as things they broke with uh, the alliance that they had since Chavez times with the with the PSUV, with the Venezuelan government, with the Chavista government, that happened like what? Uh, I'm talking about maybe 2019, I believe. That uh, that, that that split, you know, uh, actually uh, happened. Uh, and since then, they has and a little bit before that, they has been calling uh, some decisions taken by the Maduro government as neoliberal. And in my opinion, uh, that's a big mistake because uh, Chavismo has been always be very committed to to the people, to the working people, to the working class. And not to the to the corporations and and and, and the private sector and, and the big capital, uh, and uh, but in recent years, especially because of U.S. sanctions and economic crisis that that is connected to that, but that started a, a few uh, years maybe earlier, uh, has been forcing the government to take some decisions that some people might call them neoliberal, but in reality are just like strategic retreats, if you ask me, uh, uh, in order to, you know, face the crisis that is uh, a, a, a crisis that that have never been seen in Venezuela. It's, I mean, these moments that we have lived in recent years are historical moments. I mean, we never, I mean, I mean, never in Venezuelan history, uh, we face an aggression the level that we have faced uh, since 2018, 2019. So uh, if you label the Venezuelan government, some Venezuelan government decisions uh, designed to try to, you know, uh, uh, to, to survive through these difficult times, uh, uh, and you label those decisions like neoliberal without understanding the context, without putting the context in the real, you know, uh, um, level, uh, you will uh, do what the PCV is doing. I mean, you will be committing a, a big, uh, how, how, how to say it, a big mistake. Uh, in uh, in in analyzing the reality of Venezuela, so that, that's basically what I believe has happened. Uh, uh, the Venezuelan government has not been uh, doing uh, crazy uh, minimum wage adjustments as as we did years before, because that have before that didn't help us. And Maduro government since 2018 decided to be more rational especially in the monetary, uh, you know, uh, approach towards the economy. And, 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 and of course, the people in the Communist Party use that, use that as an excuse to label Maduro as a neoliberal government that has pulverized uh, the Venezuelan workers' wages and salaries and things like that. That's one of the, of the arguments they use the most. Uh, 
And again, I mean, I mean, the, the Maduro's government, the Chavista government has been doing that not because they he, he Maduro loves to do that or the Chavista do Chavistas do not care about uh, working people, but because we are in the middle of the worst crisis in our history as a nation. So, 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 and that, and those uh, strategic retreats have allowed us to take a, a little bit of air in the middle of this uh, uh, aggression from the U.S. and Europe. And, 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 and I, I have to acknowledge that to Maduro. I mean, I, I recognize that uh, the Venezuelan economy has been uh, at least not being shrink as the gringos wanted us uh, to be. Uh, so, so, so in that sense, I cannot be in the side of the Communist Party in this crazy analysis about Maduro being neoliberal. Of course, there there are, there are some things that, that, that you can say that needs to be corrected in the PSU, PSUB, but that's not new and that's not, how, I mean, for example, I, I, I always feel more sympathetic with the Venezuelan Communist Party, as I already said, because they have a cadre formation, because they have uh, more ideological, you know, uh, train people and the PSUV lack that. And I, I believe that's a big mistake uh, from the side of the PSUV. Uh, I'm not saying that everything is perfect in the PSUV. And I, I mean, uh, it isn't. Uh, and I'm, uh, and, and I would love to see uh, uh, more ideological training from the, uh, from in the PSUV, but, but, but I hope that that eventually will happen especially if we manage to get rid uh, of this war situation that we are facing right now. Uh, it's complicated, I mean, because there are many, you know, sides in the story, but if you want to, if you have more questions or I'm missing something, please tell me. <laughs> no, I mean, just listen. It's very interesting to listen to you, to be honest, um, comrade. And what, what I get when I hear that is the same feeling I get when I see the way the Greek Communist Party in particular as the kind of ringleader of this theory of, you know, an inter-imperialist war, um, what they're doing to our movement. You know, I, I, I feel the same sense of a kind of a tragedy for Venezuelan workers. that You think the communists are the people because, as you say, they have cadres who are trained. They are the people who should be the steel at the heart of the anti-imperialist revolution in Venezuela. They are the ones who should be its strongest head and its most unbreakable core. You know, that's the role of communists in a revolutionary movement. And it's the same that I see happening in the European anti-war movement. You know, where are the communists? The communists should be the steel at the center of the anti-war movement, which should be an anti-NATO movement, not a pacifist movement for, oh, we want peace, oh, isn't war yucky, but an understanding that we need the defeat of NATO to give that steel to the center of the anti-war movement and to give that thinking head to the anti-war movement so it can be guided by clear understanding. That's the role of communists in all these important movements. It's the communists that can give it the clarity and the strength and the discipline to win and to endure. And the fact that the communists have given up their position and now they stand on the side and abuse people who are trying to carry out that fight. I think it's, an, it's a tragedy and, and too many good people by this activity will just be demobilized and demoralized instead of playing the part that they should be playing. That's true. And I, that's I, you know, true. I think that's a, that's a terrible and, and, and that tragedy. what you are saying remind me of the most recent skirmishes between the PSUV and the PCV, which is that there's a group of communists, former PCV members, uh, that uh, are right now demanding to the Supreme Court to use the logo and the name of the Communist Party because they are calling uh, the PCV leadership uh, as illegitimate because they held uh, a general assembly a few months ago by the end of 2022. Uh, and they are saying this group of uh, former uh, communist PCV members, they are saying that the the, the Venezuelan Communist Party leadership is not legitimate. I mean, uh, I believe that those are fights that are not necessary, if you ask me. I mean, that we can avoid that. I mean, uh, 
I believe that from the side of the PSUV, there's people promoting this unnecessary battles. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm in favor of the Communist Party behavior. You know what I mean? I mean, there are two different things. I mean, the, the, the deep uh, analysis of the whole uh, infighting and and the and the accessory uh, fighting uh, connected to petty things like the party logo and who leads the party and why you uh, are, why the PSUV should be you know interfering in the internal affairs of the communist party and things like that. I mean, I don't like that from the side of the PSUV, but uh, I dislike more what the PCV is doing. So that's basically yeah, I, I the. Totally hear that. I mean, the, the for, from my perspective as an outsider who has no basis for judging the accusations that are being hurled, what really disturbs me is the manner of conducting this dispute, because. Mm -hmm. In an alliance, contradictions will arise and difficulties will arise, but understanding what's the major contradiction, i.e. the contradiction against imperialism, and, and subordinating the, 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 the contradictions between allies within that context is so important. And the fact that, you know, what I find shocking and irresponsible is the number of communist parties around the world who have rushed to sign every statement that the that the PCV asked them to sign. So they put out a blood curdling statement full of accusations and they say, support us, it's very important. And everybody who knows them comes along and meekly signs this statement. But most now, of the me, people, but it's totally nice that you are yes, but it's nice that you're saying that because it's true. I mean, most of these statements are like PCV, uh, I mean Venezuelan Communist Party statements that they launch in their networks. And they ask all the communist parties uh, that are not sometimes uh, well informed about what is happening in Venezuela, but they ask them to sign those statements. And, and of course, there are parties, I mean, I'm talking about communist parties around the world that are more aware of what they're doing, like the key, uh, like, like the one in Greece that you mentioned. Uh, but of course, but in the middle, I believe that there are communist parties of other countries that might not have a clue of what happened here, but they just follow the lead of the uh, uh, the communist party of Greece or the PCV or whatever. So so that, that's part of the debate. And it's true that uh, we need within this debate to identify the weakness in the, in the networks of communist parties around the world also because uh at least in my case it says a lot about a uh, communist party I, I believe that there, there there's one communist party in england i know that there are several communist parties up there uh but that sign these petitions that the venezuelan communist what is the name of that communist party that you have there that is aligned i think it's the communist party of britain okay uh, probably signed most of those statements yeah. okay okay um, they didn't sign the 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 one that was signed by many parties in Havana condemning Russian aggression. They didn't sign either of the two ones that were put out, though. They tried to take this middle position. But yes, I think they've signed quite a few of the PCV statements. I think a lot of parties think it's a way to get revolution points. You know, they sign these statements that mm. sound very revolutionary. It makes them look good. They put them on their website. Yes, we are comrades with the Venezuelan communists. You know, and it's for people who don't know anything, it just sort of looks impressive, right? Oh, yes, they're jolly revolutionary. But it's the it's the opposite of revolutionary, isn't Absolutely. it? To do something, you have to step back and ask yourself, who is this going to benefit? Does this help Venezuelan workers to have this dispute blown up in public? Does this help the cause of anti-imperialism? Or is this absolute manna from heaven for the imperialists and their propaganda war? Yes. You know, and if it's the last one, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, absolutely, absolutely. Who are you for? <laughs> so, just like you, you know, I look at who signs these statements and ask myself, why? And what are these parties thinking? How are they leading the workers in their countries? You know, and it's why we formed, just to come back to what we started with, why we formed the platform, because we really need an international anti-imperialist organization that can be clear on these things and willing to give unashamed 
leadership of anti-imperialist socialist leadership to the working class in the world and bring together all those forces which are prepared to act together in the interests of opposing NATO and US-led imperialism. Because right now, that's the question of our times. And this battle is going to def define the next 100 years. You know, It's not something we can just sit on the sidelines and say, oh, well, let's see what happens. Uh, I agree with you, Jyoti. Um, I believe that we have reached our time. We double our respecting <laughs> interview time but that usually happen <laughs> not not not, not with you I'm, I'm i'm talking also about me so it's not your fault <laughs> uh thank you yori it was a pleasure having you with us today